Charles just gave us one of those updates where he tells us about the past, present, and future. He talked about what they've done, where we are, and where we're going. We're now at a very interesting point on the Cardano timeline. We've pretty much done all the work you would need to do as a best-in-class Gen 3 cryptocurrency, and some more pieces of all that will be deployed soon. But next up is Voltaire. This is the governance era, and it might be the trickiest and most dangerous period of Cardano development yet. Ready? Let's go. There was a lot packed into this short 38 minute update, that's short by Charles standards, but I think he gave us a lot of signposts as to where the project's going to go next and where we might encounter our biggest challenges. As always, if these videos are bringing you value every weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. Okay, this is going to be another one of those discussions where we have a huge amount of information to go through, so we're going to go through this pretty rapidly. All of the Cardano Foundation and IOG senior leadership are in Colorado right now for a big internal summit all about how to better structure Cardano as an open source project. You can imagine this involves quite a bit of talk on governance. Charles says there are 400 dApps being built right now with a lot of them biased toward the second half of the year after the Vassal hard fork. That's the one you remember that we've talked about many times where we'll get SIPs 31 through 33, including the long awaited reference scripts that will make a huge difference in throughput. The project is big now and it's time to lay really robust foundations for Cardano to be run as a real open source project, whereas so far it's been run in a fairly federated manner. We'll get some updates on the back end after the summit as to exactly what governance might look like. They've tried to look at a bunch of different models for open source governance, like the Mozilla Foundation, the Apache Foundation, and the Linux Foundation. The future roles of formal methods and Haskell in the project are tied up in all of this, of course. Charles is going to a learning conference in London in May in the hopes of being able to outsource a lot of curriculum development from their internal education department to create repeatable courses for the community. They're discussing the visions for Cardano 2025 and 2027. Meanwhile, OG's goals for this year are commercial compatibility, sustainability, and self-determination. Input endorsers, pipelining, mithril, sidechains, and etc. all things we've talked about many times this channel, will get us there for commercial comparability. UTXOHD and a lot of the system optimization changes alongside Mithril will get us to sustainability. Sustainability meaning that the system can scale to millions and billions of users without imploding. On self-determination, we need a bureaucracy legitimized by the voting and endowment of the community. Obviously, if we're going to have a self-sustaining open source ecosystem, there's going to be some level of bureaucracy involved. And Charles made a good point about the bureaucracy really only working if it's legitimized by the voting and the other crucial ingredient, the endowment of the community. So you need a community with the power of the purse. As per usual, I'm putting words into Charles's mouth, but that's what I interpret from what he actually said. Charles believes we're well on schedule for all of these things. There will be new C funds for specific ge geographies, including Africa. Also, he he mentioned, you know, he kind of characterized the C funds for for a split second. There, he said, "Hey, you know, the C fund is there to help some of these projects along." And you know, let's face it, he's a billionaire, so he's got the money to do this kind of thing. There will be a blog post very soon on pipelining, and then a follow up on input endorsers. And he made kind of an interesting note about input endorsers versus pipelining. He said. Input endorsers is actually scientifically novel and a pretty big leap forward, whereas pipelining is just is not not really scientifically novel. It's just the engineering of that idea into into our system. The Mamba launch is coming this month or next month. So this was really interesting. I didn't expect this at all. He had recently, I think, made some 
gestures toward Mamba and said it was coming soon, but you know, this is crypto software development. So soon might be a couple months away or it might be, you know, five years away. But in this case, it sounds like when he said Mamba was coming soon, he really meant it was coming soon this month or next month. Mamba is the old ETC code base that they ported and modified and put OBFT on top of. You'll remember that the hard fork to go to a Byzantine fault tolerant version of Ouroboros was an important step in the move from Byron to Shelley. OBFT, Ouroboros, Byzantine fault tolerance. This harkens back to the old distinction Charles used to describe in the very early days of Cardano, even his 2016 Why Cardano paper, where a Cardano settlement layer and a Cardano computation layer would coexist. The Cardano settlement layer would establish a root of trust, be very safe and secure, and be able to spin up these computation layers that would have different computation and accounting models. Mamba will be the big introduction to side chains. This next bit is pretty interesting. He said, Mamba will also create a generic footprint for us, the users, to create our own side chains. These side chains can have their own tokens and tokenomics and create revenue streams for SPOs who want to help run these side chains as consensus nodes. There are two things that I'm really curious about right now. One of them is what types of things the community can build with this side chain capability. If Mama gives us this generic footprint that any user can take and create their own sidechain, I think the sort of the power of the crowd is going to produce some pretty interesting things. Uh, a thing I'm interested in for similar reasons is what can be built with a Tala Prism. I think once a Tala Prism is sort of in the hands of the community, of course, including the Atala pioneers, it'll be interesting to see what what the crowd can come up with given given that tool. So on both those, I'm pretty curious to see what we actually come up with. Charles says examples of future side chains will include Catalyst. Catalyst, of course, will run as a side chain. Charles hopes the community will launch lots of these side chains. Mill Commodus showed the potential for a third party to do it, but Mamba is made in abstraction so that hopefully many people will be able to follow it and it will be the canonical way to do side chains. This will, this will also enable Cardano hackathons in boot both Plutus and Solidity. So of course, once we get Mamba and Mamba uh, enables uh, an EDM sidechain that can be duplicated easily by users, then it'll be pretty easy for uh, any, any group or user to create Solidity sidechains. You could do Cardano hackathons where people could, could code in both or either of Plutus and Solidity, probably in a lot of cases, either of. We're almost done with all the things you would need for a third gen cryptocurrency. I think this is important. All the things that Cardano set out to do to create a best in class third gen cryptocurrency, they're almost done with all those things. Charles said it's been a long road and a lot of work. He said they've solved a lot of really difficult technical problems. And Voltaire and self-governance now will be about the community doing as much as IOG. But with the move toward giving millions of people a voice, we will also encounter different and new problems. We will lose agility and speed and gain inclusivity and due diligence of ideas. So now you're thinking, you're like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> what happened? We had, you know, Shelly, uh, but... What, what happened to Basho? Now we're talking about Voltaire already, which is governance, but what about Basho, which is scaling? I think what people don't realize is that all of the network parameter changes have already made a huge difference from those days of crazy congestion in, say, the, the launch days of Sunday Swap. And then with the Vassal hard fork in June, we're going to see this sort of quantum leap forward in sort of Basho deployment, all of a sudden Cardano is is going to be scaling. I mean, if, I think people, if they've if they were using Cardano during this the early Sunday swap days and they used it now, they probably noticed a huge difference in lack of congestion. And the Vassal hard fork is going to be a quantum leap in lack of congestion, at, at least in as insofar as it's launching SIPs 31 through 33. And then 
dApp developers will actually be able to use the the uh, reference inputs, inline datums, and reference scripts provided by those SIPs, or at least the tools to allow them to use those reference items that are that are uh, newly allowed by those SIPs. Charles says that a lot of institutions have yet to be formed. We're going to need research institutions, execution institutions, standards bodies, alliances like the Cardano DeFi Alliance. And Charles says he will personally be cutting checks for grants to these different alliances. And the CF, the Cardano Foundation, has plans to do the same. Charles points out, and here's where he gets into sort of the danger of this next part of the uh, of of the evolution of Cardano. It's impossible to keep everyone happy with things like protocol parameters, for example, A0 and K. You've probably seen the debate sort of raging on Twitter among the stake pool operators about these network parameters. There's tremendous debate on these kinds of subjects, and the process has to sort out the best way to achieve our goals. Charles then gave an interesting example of the process sorting out these ideas. He says there was quite a bit of good work done in the proposal for curved pledge. This was SIP 007. But when you actually measured it, it looked like the impact was actually to reduce the Nakamoto coefficient. And that's what governance has to do. It has to sort of like sort out these ideas, not just what proposal sounds like it'll work not just what proposal has a lot of good work behind it but what will actually have the best impact charles points out that everyone is always screaming for decentralization but you have to ask the question what does that actually mean what does decentralization really mean it turns out we don't really have a good metric for it in charles view is it just a number is uh, Nakamoto coefficient of 27 versus 22. Is this the right way to look at it? We'll talk about, we'll talk a little bit more about Nakamoto coefficients and their insufficiency in just a second. We also don't have a good metric for throughput. Charles rec recalls Alex Chirpernoy and Dan Friedman demonstrating a single ergo UTXO transaction with something crazy like 5,000 outputs to do the same thing in Ethereum or another account balance system would take hundreds, if not thousands of transactions. So TPS doesn't really work anymore. The second you're comparing account balance systems versus UTXO systems and whatever other architecture we invent in the future, TPS suddenly doesn't work anymore. Charles explained that Daedalus isn't a wallet. This is another place where I, I think he's pointing out misconceptions people might have. Daedalus is actually the fulfillment of the inclusive accountability and self-verification goals of Cardano. Daedalus is actually the Cardano protocol. Daedalus is slow because it's not a wallet. It's a server that gives you the whole ledger database. It's already a heavy stack of software and data, even at this point in uh, the young Cardano project's history. The point of Mithril is to give you that level of security and self-verification but with a light client. Will we be able to port all of that to the side chains? Charles says the answer so far is yes as to the side chains they're currently planning. As side chains get more exotic, the answer may be no. As we go forward under self-governance, Charles says with every move, we'll have to ask a series of questions. Does this make us more decentralized or less decentralized? Will this make us more inclusive, more inclusive, or more exclusive? Does it increase or decrease throughput? On the question of centralization versus decentralization, I would of course suggest my metric of total value decentralized or TBD that we've covered on this channel, where we measure whether delegation stake is moving into or out of multi-pools. And that could be even more specifically abstracted to stick delegation moving in and out of multi-pools that are actually in the minimum attack vector. Of course, that only works, that would only work for decisions that would affect delegation. There are, of course, many other ways in which decentralization could be affected or impacted in the Cardano ecosystem. Charles suggested that a few more additional questions we'll probably have to ask with each move will be things like, 
does this create more participation or less participation, which I think is just rephrasing kind of, of, of some of those previous questions. And will this give us more ability to self-verify or less ability? I think that last piece is pretty important and probably underappreciated by a lot of people. Charles thinks the Nakamoto coefficient is a crude metric that doesn't reflect the nuances of these protocols. And we need to add rigor to how we measure decentralization. I think this is important. Um, I think blockchains, I think we've all figured out at this point, um, since uh, the since the release of the Bitcoin white paper, it's been some time, and I think we've had, not, had enough time to figure out that these blockchains are complicated protocols. They are complicated and nuanced, and and there are many ways to accidentally centralize them. I'm probably being overly charitable by saying accidentally. In yesterday's video, you remember we covered the revelation of allegations in a lawsuit that JP Morgan may own critical infrastructure in Ethereum via a stake in Consensus, which owns both MetaMask and Infura. And we, we mainly focused on the MetaMask piece of that, given that it's such a widely used wallet. But the Infura piece may be an even more scary impact, an even more chilling impact on centralization, given that some gigantic number of Ethereum dApps all run via Infura. They don't want to run their own nodes. Um, it turns out that the uh, developers of dApps and you know platforms like exchanges, they don't necessarily want to run their own nodes in Ethereum because it's too costly and cumbersome. They don't want to do it. So they use Infura and a few other providers, but Infura apparently has some kind of gigantic market share in that market. And I saw all kinds of crazy estimates today. Some people on Twitter claiming as much as 80% of dApps in Ethereum may run via Infura. And now JP Morgan may have a stake in Infura. I don't know if those numbers are correct. I have no idea. I wasn't able to pin down exactly what percentage of dApps are running through Infura. Maybe nobody knows but Infura. And you can imagine why they wouldn't advertise that. If you're the centralized point, if you're possibly a centralized point of failure, in a network that prizes decentralization, you're not exactly going to advertise your concentration of market share um, for obvious reasons. I think we've seen in the past that crypto people would definitely recoil from that. But apparently, uh, the consensus seems to be that Infura commands some pretty incredibly centralized percentage of the the uh, sort of node market for dApps and other platforms that that need to access the ledger. And now we find out that JP Morgan, there are these, there's the revelation of these allegations, at least, that JP Morgan may actually own some stake in that piece and some stake in MetaMask, albeit indirectly through consensus. Truly horrifying for the crypto crowd. But this is just one way that a Nakamoto coefficient may not reflect true decentralization of a blockchain. On this point, Charles referenced the Moxie Marlin Spike uh, article on Web3. Moxie Marlin Spike is the founder of Signal, which apparently, unlike Telegram, is actually an encrypted messaging app. I, I guess everybody still thinks that Telegram is encrypted when, in fact, every single message you send in Telegram is stored in plain text in some database that employees of Telegram actually have access to, which creates a big problem because a lot, apparently a lot of people in Ukraine were under the impression that Telegram was encrypted and it looks like it's actually not encrypted at all. And, you know, um, Moxie Marlin Spike has gone into detail about how, um, Family members, employees of Telegram certainly live in Russia, and Russian intelligence services would possibly have access to leverage over those employees via those family members, so obviously problematic for Ukraine. But Moxie Marlin Spike in his article on Web3, that was just a little aside on hit the virtues of Signal versus Telegram, he says that in that article, he says that Web3 is really just centralized Web2 wearing the robes of decentralized Web3 in a lot of cases that he can see. And 
Charles, in, in sort of in accord with this, this position, Charles said, we just, as, as a crypto, as the whole crypto landscape, we just can't go down this road where crypto is so centralized that JP Morgan can actually own critical infrastructure in crypto. Charles went on that one beautiful thing we have going on right now is that Cardano is already right up there with the best in class smart contracting systems. And side chains will just increase our expressivity such that any other player in the smart contracting space can just be a subset of Cardano in that we will include whatever innovations they bring to the table as a side chain. So if some player either brand new or already existing comes on the scene with some brand new innovation, some big leap forward. We'll just absorb that. We'll just make that a side chain. We'll make that a subset of Car of Cardano. Charles compared this to the Borg of Star Trek. You probably already know, but the Borg would kind of just show up and assimilate other civilizations. Finally, Charles said that Voltaire would be the most dangerous phase of Cardano. And I think in a lot of ways, he's right here. We've gone from academic research to engineering, but Voltaire will be governance. And there is no government, there is no government in the world that everyone loves. Voltaire will not please every single person either. The best we can hope for is that everyone is heard. I personally love this realist approach. It, if you've studied governance at all, you know that it always involves trade-offs and sort of like best compromises and pleasing the largest amount of people that you can, but never being able to please all the people. I think Charles is preparing us for this sectarian infighting that will inevitably come with self-governance. Because the, the second you have self-governance, we go from people complaining that IOG is not doing X thing that serves their best interest, right? And they're not so much concerned, uh, concerned about the trade-offs with that. They're concerned about their best interest, which is predictable and acceptable. Every person is going to act in their best interest a lot of the time. Um, I'm not saying there isn't any altruism, there is, but most of the time we can expect most people to act in their own best interest and they don't think about the trade-offs inherent in them getting that benefit necessarily. What other groups won't get what they want. So right now we just have different groups, people with different interests complaining that IOG is not doing X thing, which would serve their best interest. In the future, under self-governance, everyone's going to be voting and using the power of the purse to endow the bureaucracy with funds to do what the community wants. But there are going to be different self-interested groups that want different things in our ecosystem. And under self-governance, they're going to be voting against each other to get the purse, the community purse directed at the things they want. There's going to be this sectarian infighting. And there's a very significant community purse to be wielded by our community. The community, the Cardano community will have quite a bit of economic power. And wherever there is significant economic power to be expended, there will be conflict. I'm afraid that's the that's the way the world works. We see this in all governments. There are always various factions, various political parties all vying for the community's funds to be spent in the direction they deem most appropriate. I think Cardano will be no different. Some people will be a little bit freaked out when the this kind of uh, conflict between different groups becomes really apparent under self-governance. I think it's unavoidable and it's something we just kind of have to embrace as an inherent piece of the self-governance thing. It's definitely gonna be a more chaotic time than this time now under um, more under IOG's direction. But I think we just have to embrace the chaos and in conflict inherent in self-governance. I hope everybody's having a great week and I'll talk to you tomorrow.